On behalf, this is not live. Right? On behalf of the Friends of the Scranton Public Library Poetry Series, I'd like you to like to welcome you to our program tonight, and to tell you first of all that it's being funded in part through grants from the Lackawanna County Cultural Commission Arts to the People Program, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, as well as many individuals and organizations in the area. Tonight, we are very proud to have Robert Bly, who has been a very strong influence on American poetry for almost 30 years now, both as an editor of his magazine that was originally called the 50s, then the 60s, then the 70s, and I've been told it's going to be revived in form called the 80s. He's also been well known and influential as a translator, introducing many poetry readers in this country to poets from South America, Europe, India, that we would otherwise perhaps have neglected. And of course, his own poetry, many volumes of which uh, have received wide recognition. Some of the most recent ones, are The Man in the Black Coat Turns, Loving a Woman in Two Worlds, and incidentally, after the reading, we will have several of these books on sale. He has also been very influential for his speculations and writings in recent years on such subjects as Carl Jung, uh, masculine and feminine roles in society, fairy tales, mythology, which has given him an audience beyond the usual poetry audience. And this evening, we are also proud to say that uh, in the latter part of the program, there's going to be a collaboration between Robert Bly and a classical Indian dancer, Nina Gulati, who has performed in her native India. And since she has moved to this country, in many places, including the United Nations General Assembly, they're going to be accompanied also by Todd Narden playing the tabla drums. And this will involve some translations that Robert Bly has done of Indian poets such as Kabir and Mirabai. So at this time, I'm very proud to be able to present to you Robert Bly. Don't get it open, we're in trouble. <laughs> Here a good musician in the crowd says, oh no, you're doing a drawing. sit there. I'll take off my shoes. Everyone needs to read poetry with their shoes off. You may take off yours if you wish.
So I'm glad uh, to be here, and thank you for coming. And thank you for to the friends of the library and others who worked to invite me. Maybe. So, so we're going to have a poetry reading tonight, but it isn't really a reading, it's a, it's a recital. And uh, when I began to do poems, uh, we always read from a book, so it was a reading. But uh, I ran into some of the Russian poets, for example, and they memorize all their poems. They never read one from the page. In fact, a Russian poet came to this country, and um, am I bleeding? I was bleeding. I cut myself shaving. Something is off. Now I need that Kleenex, David. Well, watch me. Don't let me bleed on my shirt, will you? <laughs> so the other day, this will tell you where I am. Thank you. I, um, I didn't go out last year at all and earn any money, and so we had to borrow a lot of money from the bank. So I started to pay it back this fall. And I began about eight days ago in California. I did a men's group. And uh, we had about 70 men near Los Angeles in the mountains. And it went wonderfully for two and a half days. And uh, we all ended up hugging each other and had a great time. So I knew something would be off. So the drummer that I had hired, who was working with me, tried to get out of Ojai, couldn't get to back to Seattle. The plane was three hours late. He got to Seattle Airport. His car wouldn't start. By the time he got it started, he missed the ferry. So those are the things that happen if things don't go, if they go too well. And you cut yourself, you know. As for me, I stayed overnight in Ojai and got on a plane to go to Chicago the next day. And I loosened my belt to take a nap. And then when the plane arrived, I stood up in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, the aisle and my pants fell down. <laughs> so then I got off at a hotel in Oak Park as I was going to visit the Oak Park High School, which is Hemingway's old high school. And I decided to go out to get some supper. So I found a New York Times, one of those metal things, you know, you put in five dimes when you get the New York Times. I had five dimes. I was wearing a raincoat, so I put it in. And I was too in much of a hurry to get dinner, and I walked past it. Somehow my raincoat got caught when the door closed. <laughs> there I was standing in the Chicago street about 10 o'clock at night without any more dimes. <laughs> and you know, you look ridiculous standing there <laughs> caught by a, you know, a paper machine. And I didn't know whether to, you know, to stop some fellow and say, you know, could you give me a five dime? <laughs> Or the other thing I could do is to drag it down the street behind me, which is even more absurd. So finally, I, I pulled on it desperately, pitifully, looking around to see if anyone was watching. And eventually, I um, pulled it out. And then I cut myself shaving. So <coughs> how is it doing? Better. Better? If it starts to drip, tell me. And the. The woman at the restaurant where we ate as a wait waitress, she came with a huge chunk of ice. I wish she were here right now. Anyway, we should go. I suppose we're going to start. Anyway, you're talking about poetry <coughs> readings. You're talking about something which our ancestors knew well. They never took poetry in on the page. They took it. They heard it. And the trouble with taking poetry in on the page is that, first of all, it goes to your brain. It doesn't belong there. It belongs down here. So there's two steps needed. I mean, what they teach you in school is to take it into the brain, but that's only the first step. The next step has to be you have to move it yourself down into your stomach, which they usually don't teach you. But when you do it by the voice, it goes into the ear and directly to the stomach. Unless, of course, you've got a big brain and you hold it up there. So if you're feeling it being held in your brain, let it go, let it come down. And try to listen to the poems with your body. And that's because sound, uh, sound will carry it into the body. 
And of course, that's one reason for memorizing is because the sound of the poem becomes much stronger than when you try to read. Uh, it's the same thing with your children. Never read a fairy story to your children. Memorize it. Then you can really do the witch parts well. That's the stuff in the fairy tales. Not, don't say, then a witch spoke. <laughs> so the second thing that happens when you read a poem on the page is that there's no way to slow you down. So it goes faster than your brain can take it in. There's nothing on the page to slow you down. If they took a, took a poems and they put one line in each book, then you'd read that line, close the book, and then have to get the other one and open it up. That would be sensible. But they don't. They put a whole bunch of poems on a single page, and in the anthologies, they're death of poetry anthology. So <clears throat> I'll slow it down uh, with my voice, and then I'll use an instrument and slow it down further. And then in the second half of the program, Nina Golati will dance every line, and you'll see how that slows it down tremendously. So the point is to slow it down as far as you can. Um, so <clears throat> we'll just begin, and I'll read you some poems. And I thought I'd begin with a passage that I found in James Stevens, who was an Irish poet around the time of, of uh, Yeats, and a little guy about four feet, five inches tall. He wrote small poems, too. but. Uh, and I found, I was reading an autobiography, and I found a little passage in here that he had said. And the Irish have a great sense of poetry. And I'm going to read this to you and see if you think that I should use it to open the reading again. Something he said on June 22, 1907. The poet must not sing at the touching of a button, but with pain and the sweat of his brow, the way all good work is done. The muse must be wooed with the passion of a lover. A cold heart never made a poem, nor a hot head either. Let our poet sing loudly. An eagle doesn't warble like a dicky bird. <laughs> if you are a citizen of the sun, don't look as if you lived in tallow candle land. I think he's talking about mumbling poems. You know, you go to an English poet reading, and the person stands up and says, well, I'm going to read some poems tonight, but uh, I don't you know, no one likes poets anymore. And uh, I'm nothing but a poet, and I don't think the poems are any good either. <laughs> By that time, you're so depressed, you forget it. <laughs> if you're a citizen of the sun, don't look as if you lived in tallow candle land. When you sing a love song, let the girl hear you. Sing of God and sing greatly. The world, the flesh, and the devil are to your hands. And the lust of the flesh and the delight of the eye and the pride of life are part of your human nature, clamant for expression. Sing the woe of the hunted rabbit when his legs begin to fail and he hears the toothed devil close behind. And sing, too, the joy of the dog when he leaps and feels the red, warm tide flush his throat. That's nice, isn't it? Sing both the rabbit about to be eaten and the joy of the dog who's eaten him. This is a non-vegetarian sort of scene here. <laughs> the joy of the dog when he leaps and feels the red, warm tide flush his throat. Battle, murder, and sudden death. Hope, effort, and escape. See it and understand it, and tell us of it. We will listen like little children to you if you're big enough to be listened to. That's nice, huh? So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do then tonight is to, when you do a poetry reading, it really needs to have some sort of shape. Certain kinds of poetry reading, you just start a poem and let it go. But usually you need a small audience then who's willing to tell you what they want. Another way is to give the poem and the poetry reading a shape in itself. So I'm going to do that tonight. And what I'm going to do is to give examples of the distinction uh, that the ancients knew and brought forward in our time by James Hillman, the greatest psychologist alive in the United States now. And that's the difference between soul and spirit. In ancient times, soul was thought to be like water and it goes down. Spirit is associated with fire, and it goes up. They used to say that soul is female in tone and associated with water, and it goes down. Spirit is male in tone only. It's in both men and women, but it's male in tone, associated with fire, and it goes up. That distinction has been very useful to me. So in the first half of this program, I'm going to do some soul poems alone. 
And then when Nina comes in, we're going to do some spirit poems. You see the, the, what we're going to do? Going to go down first and then up. Hillman makes certain speculations, which is that uh, we don't have, in the old times, there's mind, body, soul, and spirit. The Puritans took care of our body, about finished that off. Then, when you're in business, you don't need mind, body, or soul. You, need, you, don't, you don't need mind, uh, soul, or spirit. You need mind. You need mind. You don't care about body. And basically, as Helen says, ours is a mind civilization. And if you go and look at New York and see the skyscrapers in Wall Street, you know exactly what it means. Because mind is something that computers have. Mind, you understand what I'm saying? Mind is, uh, universities are mind. If you meet the soul there, you're lucky. So basically, we live in a mind uh, civilization. It's not bad, it's just a characteristic of the civilization. Joseph Campbell sometimes talks about the difference when we would approach, you would approach a medieval city in the Middle Ages, and you would see this huge church rising entirely above the whole village. And that stood for soul, in the darkness of the church, soul is dark and spirit is, is light. When you went inside Charter, you felt that darkness and dimness of the soul. And then shh, up it went. So the soul and the spirit were at the center of the town. When you go to Wall Street today or any American city, you see the financial district first. So Joseph Campbell says, think of what that does to the psyche. When you're used to seeing a church, your ancestors saw a church at the center of the village. And when you look, you see money at the center of the thing. That means we tend to put not the soul at the center of our own soul, but money. Oh, that's the way it is. That's the way it is, that's all. It's hard to blame anybody. It's just the way it is. That means we have to work to develop both soul and spirit. Hmm? I'm a Protestant myself, but I feel bad about the disappearance of the parochial schools that the Catholics had because they tried to teach a little soul and spirit. Hmm? Now they're getting taken over by huge standardized schools. Catholic, and I come from a little town in Minnesota, Catholic school there used to go high school, then it cut down to now 12th, now it went down to 8th, now down to 6th, now it's only up to the 4th grade. Well, Pope's got his problems too, but... No. So therefore, what are the qualities of soul? First of all, in soul, you have the sensation you're going down. If you're at a wedding, it'll often be a spirit ceremony. The bride will come in dressed in white. And sometimes in the middle of that, you'll start crying without knowing why you're doing it. And the ancients called that dropping down, dropping down, dropping down into the moist place, which is the soul. When someone honors a human being by having them walk up the aisle like that and put all that tremendous thing around them, the soul feels it and starts to weep. Sometimes you'll weep at funerals, too. So the soul is connected with weeping. The soul is connected with the ability to weep. And the Sufis always said, if you haven't wept for a month, you're in trouble. Spiritually, better check it out. So, so I'm going to do about ten soul poems. They'll have a slight tone of depression about them, like heavy tone. At the same time. We have to make a distinction between depression and grief. Oftentimes in America, we're supposed to be cheerful all the time. Do you notice that Reagan never is depressed his whole life? <laughs> Everything that happens, he smiles about. That's why we elected him. And when, uh, when you're cheerful all the time, and you refuse to go down into any kind of sorrow, then it may be that a hand will come up and pull you down. <coughs> That's called depression. And uh, because you didn't choose a time to come down, go down, you can't choose a time to come up either. 
And oftentimes in depression, you have the feeling it's going to be this way the rest of your life. Do you know that feeling when you're depressed? When I'm depressed, I don't want my friends to see me because I'm too boring. But grief is something in which you choose to go down yourself. Some people, for example, if their parent dies, chooses to grieve. They won't accept any uh, cheering up. And that isn't understood in this country, you know. The ministers and the and the undertakers have been in cahoots for years to prevent us from grieving at funerals. They'll even cover that dirt that's so beautiful with fake green grass. So you think, ah, oh, he's not going down into the dirt, it's just some Disneyland he's going to. <coughs> in our part of the country, they don't even lower the coffin during the service anymore at the funeral. They're afraid you might weep. That's un-American, you shouldn't do that. When my, when my uh, grandmother, my second grandmother was buried, they wouldn't lower the coffin. And later, the undertaker sneaks out there about six o'clock at night and lowers it into the ground. How do you think she feels about that? I'm gonna begin with a poem by Antonio Machado, the Spanish poet that I love very much. Antonio Machado died in 1939. He was a very quiet poet. He taught French in a small high school in northern Spain for something like 20 years. Not one of his students ever remembered him. <laughs> After he'd been teaching high school about five years, it occurred to him that his soul was dead. Have any of you ever taught high school? <laughs> you know exactly what it means. It occurred to him that his soul was dead. And he wrote this poem. The sun one brilliant day came to my soul with an odor of jasmine. The wind, one brilliant day, called to my soul with an odor of jasmine. And the wind said, in return for the odor of the jasmine, I'd like all the odor of your roses. And Machado said, I have no roses. All the flowers in my garden are dead. And the wind said, well, then I'll take the withered petals and the fallen leaves. And the wind left. And I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? Strong poem, isn't it? Do you want it once more? If you want to hear a poem twice, just raise your fingers like that. You want to let that one go, or you want to hear it twice? This is the kind of poem that we don't do much. It's a conversation. The wind one brilliant day called to my soul with an odor of jasmine. And the wind said, in return for the odor of the jasmine, I'd like all the odor of your roses. 
Machado said, I have no roses. All the flowers in my garden are dead. You know that feeling you get? And the wind said, well, then I'll take the, I'll take the withered petals and I'll take the yellow leaves. And the wind left. And I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? All right. In a way, these poems could be called failure poems. And the other day, a friend of mine was publishing his first book of essays. He's from a little town called Minneota, Minnesota. His name is Bill Holm. And he had a wonderful essay in it called The Music of Failure. And in it, he said, you know, one, that's one of the three Icelandic towns in all the United States. And he said, you know, everyone in Minneota is a failure. I mean, if they'd been successful as farmers in Iceland, they would have never come here. <laughs> to get the mosquitoes and stuff. So he said, we're all sons and grandsons of failures. And he said, America can absorb any experience except failure, apparently. Isn't that interesting? And then he said, maybe it's, maybe our reluctance to admit failure has something to do with our fear of reliving or knowing about our grandfathers and grandmothers' lives. And boy, I thought of those immigration pictures that my grandmother and, you know, those pictures they take of, they knew failure, all right, boy. Don't fool yourself. Then the next generation smiling. My generation vests the whole thing. Could I borrow a? Uh, could I borrow your little blanket? Whatever. I'll put it here so it doesn't slide off. Thank you. Piano benches are shiny. I don't mind these weird things that happen. If nothing bad happens, you know, it would be worse. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a poem of mine. So I tried to think of my work, and I said, what failure poems do I have? <coughs> I just published a book of love poems, uh, which I'll read a couple toward the end, called Loving a Woman in Two Worlds. And you know, all love poems are victory poems in a way. Aren't they? No, huh? OK, maybe you're right. And um, <laughs> they start as victory poems. In this planet, loving someone is a victory in itself. How it goes, that's different. So I start to think about failure poems. And I, I have this one. It's a new one. I'll read it to you. After brooding a while over my childishness, I noticed holes that the crickets have eaten in the blanket. Now, in Minnesota, if you forget and you leave a blanket out overnight, you'll find cricket holes in it the next morning. I saw them. After brooding a while over my childishness, I noticed holes that the crickets have eaten in the blanket. The man and woman stretched out asleep will find the cold slipping into those holes. What we don't see enters during the night and frightens the red-haired divorcee who brings her lover to the emergency door. And at the funeral, we say, how could we have missed it? A man and a woman live together and build a house, and the whole roof falls if they let one board go. What we do not care for fills the mouth if we fail to say a certain essential word. So that poem at the end is about the value of talking. You know what I mean? Women are always bugging men to talk more. Man, it isn't really fair because you can do it so easily. It's like men say to women, let's run 400 miles today. What do you say? And yet there's something wonderful in the way women keep asking. My wife has taught me a lot about that thing, because the older I get, the more I know it's important to say certain things. 
At Thanksgiving, certain things need to be said. At Christmas, certain things need to be said. When your daughter is 16, certain things need to be said to her. When your son is four, five, six, seven, certain things need to be said, and we don't say them. You understand what I'm saying? Brought up my sons, and it's, you know, well, hell, they know this. So more and more I respect that, being ability, being able to talk and say things. I'll read you the poem once more. Shall I do the business? See if it's still here. Listen how the, the music changes it now. <laughs> After brooding a while over my childishness, I notice the holes that the crickets have eaten in the blanket. A man and woman stretched out asleep will find the cold slipping in through those holes. What we do not see enters during the night, and it frightens the red-haired woman who brings her lover to the emergency door. I don't know what that scene is. At the funeral, we all say, how could we have missed it? A man and a woman live together and make a house, and the whole roof falls if they let one board go. What we do not care for fills the mouth if we fail to say a single essential word. Can you feel yourself brought down a little bit with those poems? Hmm? Can you? <laughs> now she's laughing. You think that's a... Here's another little one I'll do for you. I think a man has to be a maybe 35 or 40 before he begins to respect sorrow or grief. It was so with me. This is a dulcimer. This is an American instrument, the only American instrument. Native American instrument from the Appalachian Mountains. It's a little poem of my own. What is sorrow for? It is a storehouse of wheat, barley, corn, and tears. One steps to the door on a round stone, like those granaries in Norway. And the storehouse feeds all the birds of sorrow. And I say to myself, will you have sorrow at last? Go on, be cheerful in autumn. Be stoic, yes. Be tranquil, calm. Or in the valley of sorrows, spread your wings. Those are little poems that it's a poem I made of myself. You want it once more? I don't know what the rest of you do. You're going to have to listen. What is sorrow for? You 
You know, I think my father was an alcoholic, still is. And I think early on in our family, my brother and I were sort of told to be the cheerful ones. You know what I mean with that? You're given a certain task in your family to conceal family secrets. You know that one? I think that's the order we got from somebody. So it's only recently that I really wanted to feel the sorrow of my own childhood, as well as sorrow, which is beautiful. What is sorrow for? It is a storehouse of wheat, barley, corn, and tears. The storehouse feeds all the birds. One steps to the door on a round stone, and the storehouse feeds all the birds of sorrow. And I say to myself, will you have sorrow at last? Go on, be cheerful in August. Be tranquil, calm, be stoic, yes. Or in the valley of sorrows, spread your wings. And I know that these poems don't mean as much to high school or college students as they do to older people. But one of the reasons I love to come to places like this, as opposed to going to colleges straight, is that you can talk to adults here, places like this. I enjoy talking to adults. College students are okay. They're a little elementary and they're too cheerful. But... <laughs> All right. But their disasters will come later. We'll arrange it for them. Um, I'll give you one more of these poems. We're staying with the image now of the soul is going down. And Hillman said an incredible thing that blew me away completely. He said, do you realize how difficult it is for any of us to go into soul? Because the worst thing that happened to the men in our culture is they've all inherited the Hercules complex. Which you, uh, the Hercules complex, what is that? Regarding everything in life is an obstacle to be overcome. I am Hercules. I can take on your pain. Give it to me. I carry it. I got to be a little cheerful, you know. I'm bleeding out of 19 pores, but that's all right. I am Hercules. You know that one? All the men know it. Do you know it? Yeah. And so Hillman said one of the few times we experienced, he said, spirit is connected with victory and uh, soul is connected with defeat. And one of the few times we experience soul in our culture is when we're sick. That means the bacteria won. <laughs> Beautiful. You end up lying on your back, defeated by the bacteria, and then for the first time in six months, you feel a little soul. Huh? A little soul. That's so wonderful. So the images are defeat, sorrow, weeping, grief, going down. I'll give you one more poem I wrote on that. What choice do we have but to go down? How can I be close to you if I'm not sad? The clam tumbles in the surf, and Amber holds the secret desires that the bee felt before his room grew silent. The lonely man reads by his lamp at night. What is it that we want? Some ancient man, half bear and half human, knows what we want. And the more he talks to us, the swifter we tumble down. There's a reference in there. Did you feel that reference is a, a being in fairy stories called the Wild Man? He's married to a woman called the Wild Woman. He's covered with hair. So is his wife. The Wild Woman has hair all over her body except on the, the nipples and the elbows. <laughs> Strange. Sometimes when I talk in the Wild Man and the Wild Woman, I show a slide. For example, John the Baptist was the wild man in uh, Christian mythology, and he baptized Jesus. And the wild woman was Mary Magdalene. And I could show you a slide of Mary Magdalene done by Durer, in which it shows Mary Magdalene being carried to the sky by four hairy little angels. <laughs> and she is completely covered with hair except on her nipples and her elbow. I showed it in a church once. Blew the minds of a lot of old ladies, I tell you.
I fell off. They made a little improvised stage, and I fell off it an instant later. So I walked over, and I said, well, this is what happened to you. Show a slide of Mary Magdalene in the church. <laughs> and you go. What choice do we have but to go down? How can I be close to you if I'm not sad? I wrote that line for my wife. How can I be close to you if I'm not sad? The clam tumbles in the surf, and amber holds the secret desires that the bee filled before his room grew silent. The lonely man reads by his lamp at night. What is it that we want? What is it that we want? Some ancient man, half bear and half human, knows what we want. And the more he talks to us, the swifter we tumble down. Some ancient woman, half bear and half woman, knows what we want. You want to do it for women, hmm? All right. I think that I'll read, um, since someone spoke to me at dinner and said, I heard you read a poem of Anna Akhmatova a couple of years ago. And, um, and uh, so I said, well, I thought uh, maybe I'd read one tonight. Anna Akhmatova is a great Russian woman poet. And uh, she is loved tremendously in Russia. She had tremendous soul. And uh, Stalin especially hated her guts. And he refused to allow her to publish for 15 years. And at one point, someone in, that someone in there snuck a book of hers out around 1950 or something like that. And within, uh, within a week, there were lines uh, three blocks long at the bookstores. The price went up to 50 rubles. And then Stalin heard about it. And he called back every book not only from the bookstores, but every book sent to a library. So they got this dramatic thing in their culture, you know. <laughs> so I'll give you two poems of Anak Matova. Most of the love affairs she had didn't turn out well. I suppose that's what you mean by uh, love affairs. I mean, love poems not always being victories, huh? Is that what you meant? Didn't you? I'm sorry, I thought it was you. All right, are you ready? I'll do two bones of Anik Madhava. These are translated by Jane Kenyon, a young woman poet in New Hampshire. I did not close the door. I did not light the candle. You don't know how tired I was. I could not bring myself to lie down. And to think that everything's ruined, that we suffer like the damned in hell. Oh, I was certain that he would come back. She's a great artist, and so what she does is take you to her point of deepest grief, and then she stops. Like Emily Dickinson that way. Whereas many in our culture, you know, she'll go on talking about how he didn't come back and how he was a shit and stuff, and finally after two or three pages, you don't care if he came back or not. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the poem again. I did not light the candle. I did not close the door. You don't know how tired I was. I could not bring myself to lie down. And to think that everything's ruined. 
And we suffer like the damned in hell. Oh, I was certain that he would come back. Hmm? Great things. And here's the one that I, that, I, that I just got. I'm publishing this book. It's going to be the first book in the 80s press. 20 Poems of Anna Akhmatova, translated by Jane Kenyon. Could you feel a little soul in that one? Mm. There's a lot of guts in being able to go into soul and not buy Hallmark greeting cards all the time. <laughs> all right, here's one of hers. I'll read you this one because I haven't memorized it yet. Everything's just as it was. Fine hard snow beats against the dining room windows. And I myself have not changed. Even so, a man came to call. I asked him, what do you want? He said, to be with you in hell. I laughed. It seems you see a little trouble ahead of us. Hmm? But lifting his dry hand, he lightly touched the flower. Tell me how they kiss you. Tell me how you kiss. That's what he said. And his half-closed eyes remained in my ring, probably her wedding ring. And his half-closed eyes remained in my ring. Not even the smallest muscle moved in his serenely angry face. Oh, I know it fills him with joy, this hard and passionate certainty that there is nothing he needs and nothing I can keep from him. <laughs> How do you like that? Would you say that's a woman capable of understanding her own grief? Mm, that's a really tough boy. And that's a wonderfully line, his serenely angry face. You know you got trouble if you were the man who's serenely angry, <laughs> just leave immediately. <laughs> and the amazing thing about her, she saw the whole thing. She saw his dry hand touch of flowers. She, see, he said, you know, all this stuff. She said, what do you want? He says, to be with you in hell. That's heavy, don't you think? Heavy. She should have left right then. She laughed instead, and she said, it seems you see plenty of trouble ahead for us both. By lifting his dry hand, he lightly touched the flowers. Tell me how they kiss you. Tell me how you kiss. He had curiosity anyway. And his half-closed eyes remained in my ring. Not even the smallest muscle moved in his serenely angry face. Oh, I know it fills him with joy, this hard and passionate certainty that there is nothing he needs and nothing I can keep. Recipe for disaster. But there's nothing like that in American poetry, is it? Every poetry is, every culture's poetry is needed. And they're all fragments of one poetry somehow. All right, shall we go on? I'm going to give you maybe three more of these soul poems, and then we'll have a very brief stretch, and then we'll do the thing with Nina. So someone asked me to do a poem called Finding the Father. With men, I have found out from being in men's groups, a lot of their suffering lies in relation to their fathers. Since the Industrial Revolution, you know, the father has been out of the house. That's never happened before. Boys and men were always with their father for hundreds and thousands of years. Work with them, live with them. Since the Industrial Revolution, they've been 30 miles away. And in general, the women's values fill the house now. It's not her fault, it's just that she's the only one left in the house. And so oftentimes, the male loses his son five minutes after birth. So I wrote a poem about that. Uh, that's just metaphorical, you understand me, but there's this terrific distance between fathers and sons. Partly it's the father's fault. Partly it's the fault of the Industrial Revolution. Fathers are not doing their job well in this culture. But it doesn't matter what's happened. You can feel the distance. So I'm writing, this is a poem called Finding the Father. My friend, this body 
offers to carry us for nothing. You know, your body doesn't even charge you for breathing for you. My friend, this body offers to carry us for nothing, as the ocean carries logs. So on some days, the body wails with its great energy. It smashes up the rock, lifting small crabs that flow around the side. There's a knock at the door. We don't have time to dress. He wants us to come with him through the blowing and rainy streets to the dark house. We will go there, the body says, and there find the father whom we have never met, who wandered out in the snowstorm the night his child was born, who then lost his memory and has lived since working in Australia as a sheep herder or as a restaurant cook who painted at night, longing for his child whom he saw only once. When you light the lamp, when you light the lamp, you will see him. He sits there behind the door the forehead so light, the eyebrows so heavy, lonely in his whole body waiting for you. That's a poem about the loneliness of fathers in the United States. Can you feel it? And I don't mean that only the, the boys are lonely for their father. The girls are too. Fathers are a long ways off. I think I'll do uh, one more poem, a poem I wrote for my father. And uh, my father uh, and my mother are both in an old people's home in Minnesota. And one thing I noticed a few years ago, how difficult it is to look into the faces of our parents when they're getting old. And I think it's because if we look into their faces, it's clear they're going to die. And if they're going to die, it's a good chance that we're going to die. Good chance. So rather than do that, we get them in the old people's home, get rid of them. So this is a poem about the prodigal son. You all know the prodigal son story? Do you, most of you? Good, in California, I have to explain the whole thing. <laughs> Now, in the, in the third stanza of this little poem, there's a Hasidic story. And the Hasids were uh, a wonderful bunch uh, living in uh, Poland and so on. And they often lived in the same apartment for two to three generations. And the Jews are very good anyway in fighting with their fathers. You know, they drag them around the floor and stuff like that. At least it catches the attention of the father. <laughs> Better with us, what do we do? You get home from college saying, hi, Dan, how is he? How's the weather been? He says, oh, the weather isn't too good. It's kind of rainy today. That's it. All the conversation you're going to have for the whole vacation. All right, here's the poem. It's called The Prodigal Son. The prodigal son is kneeling in the husks. He remembers the man about to die who cried, Don't let me die, doctor. That was a friend of mine in high school. He remembers the man about to die who cried, Don't let me die, doctor. The swine go on feeding in the sunlight. When he kneels, his knees on corn cobs. He sees the smoke of ships floating off the aisles of Tyre and Sidon and farther beyond, farther beyond, farther. An old man once, being dragged across the floor by his shouting son, cried, don't drag me any farther than this crack on the floor. I only dragged my father that far. <laughs> my father is 75 years old. How difficult it is, bending the head, looking into the water. Under the water, there's a door that the pigs have gone through. 
I'll give you the last two stanzas again. I don't think you'll understand the last line. I don't understand it myself. I, I wrote the poem up to that point. I spent six months writing the last line. I did innumerable versions. And every time I tried to look down into the water to see my father's face, I bounced back up again. And finally, I got a line that goes under the water anyway. I don't know what it means. I just feel a little in my stomach when I say it. So I know it's right and leave it there. Mm, how did that one go? Um, the prodigal, when he kneels his knees on corn cobs, he sees the smoke of ships floating off the isles of Tyre and Sidon and farther beyond farther beyond farther. An old man once being dragged across the floor by a shouting son cried, don't drag me any farther than that crack on the floor. I only dragged my father that far. My father is 75 years old. How difficult it is bending the head, looking into the water. Under the water, there's a door that the pigs have gone through. So, I've been reading about 50 minutes now, and I'm going to do two love poems, and we're going to stop. Love poems are a form of soul poems, too, aren't they? You know, D.H. Lawrence is a great soul writer. And he's a great soul writer because he talks about not only blood and so on, but the relationship between men and women. And that's a place to develop soul. If you want to do it painfully, do it that way. I'm just joking. But do you understand how difficult the relationship between men and women are? Mm. And uh, amazing. I think women are from another planet myself. That's the way women think about us, so. Now we're approaching spirit. And after these two poems, we're going to move into spirit. And this poem I wrote for my wife, we were on a way in a plane to a meditation retreat in Kansas at the time. And I thought later it wasn't an accident in the way that we were going to something connected with spirit. A man and a woman sit near each other. And they do not long at this moment to be older or younger or born in any other time or any other nation or any other place. They are content to be where they are, talking or not talking. Their breaths together feed someone whom we do not know. The man sees the way his fingers move. He sees her hands close around a book that she hands to him. They obey a third body that they share in common. They have made a promise to love that body. Age may come, parting may come, death will come. A man and a woman sit near each other. And as they breathe, they feed someone whom we do not know, whom we know of, but have never seen. I showed that poem to Galway Canal because, you know, I must, these poems I've rewritten, I don't know, 60 or 70 versions of every poem. And when they get on there to the 50th version or so, you send them to your friends. Say, what do you think? Galway said, I had to hear, age may come, parting may come, death may come. He said, what do you mean, Robert, death may come? I said, all right. <laughs> death will come. But I didn't put anything, I didn't change age. He didn't notice that one. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so I left that one in there. All right, I think I'll do one more. I think I'll do um, the last one in the book, maybe. Would you like a poem about marriage? Okay, I'll do a poem about marriage, and that we'll end then with that, and uh, have a little break. And this is called "Listening to the Colton Concert." Some of you may know Keith Jarrett. He's a wonderful musician, trained as a classical musician, and he picked up certain tunes and uh, popular rhythms of the United States in the 20s and 30s. He's Hungarian, and then he'll sit down at the piano with all of that, and he'll improvise for two to three hours. In Tokyo recently, he improvised for eight hours straight. And when he was in Cologne a few years ago. He did a magnificent improvisation in Cologne, staggering. And they, they uh, printed it as the Kuln Concert, K-O-L-N. And you can still get the record. I think it's a great record, the Kuln Concert. His piano was particularly wonderful that night. And so uh, we were listening to that, and I wrote this poem called Listening to the Kuln Concert. <laughs> After we had loved each other intently, we heard notes tumbling together in late winter, and we heard ice falling from the ends of twigs. The notes abandoned so much as they move. They are the food not eaten, the comfort not taken, the lies not spoken. This music is my attention to you. And when the music came again, and when the music came again, later in the day, I saw tears in your eyes. I saw you turn your face away so that the others would not see. When men and women come together, how much they have to abandon. Wrens make their nests of fancy threads and string in. Animals abandon all their money each year. It's my best line. Animals abandon all their money each year. What is it that men and women leave harder than Wren's doing. They have to abandon their longing for the perfect. Harder than Wren's doing. They have to abandon their longing for the perfect. The inner nest, not made by instinct, will never be quite round. And each has to enter the nest made by the other imperfect bird. So that's my poem about marriage. Now, we're going to have a stretch. Don't leave the room because it'll take too long to get you back. Are you exhausted? You want to quit now? Are you ready to go on? Aren't you glad to get rid of soul finally? Because now you're...